All right. Well, welcome to uh, 801 Labs, and thanks for coming to tonight's talk. Um, thanks for the introduction, John. My name is Malcolm, and I'm just here tonight to share my journey through uh, learning about hard drive encryption, because I woke up one day and realized, wow, everything on my hard drive is totally vulnerable to anyone who might want to steal it. And that's a lot of important stuff, like tax information, some passwords, stuff I'd really like to keep private. Um, so thanks for coming out tonight. Um, right off the bat, let's see, I want to make sure my slides actually go forward. What's going on here? Why are you not cycling? There we go. This was working two seconds ago. Okay, so uh, before we get into this, I just want to put out the obligatory disclaimers out there. Um, someone already asked, I do not work in information technology. I'm not a professional at this. If you follow my advice, I guarantee you, you'll lose all your data and you'll be screwed. So um, just uh, be wary that you need to back up your stuff, go carefully with any sensitive data, and um, you know there's no warranties. I'm also not making any money off of this, and I don't have any conflicts of input conflicts of interest and all the pictures I got are used under the fair use doctrine from the internet. Um, as we delve in on the next slide, there's a cartoon that um, several of you have probably seen already. And I think it's really important because as we start talking about this, it exposes kind of a, a cynical reality lurking behind a lot of people's enthusiasm for encryption. So take a look at this if you haven't already. Raise your hand if you've heard the phrase $5 wrench before. I don't know if XKCD invented it, but they sure made it a lot more popular. Um, the basic idea is that you can learn all the magic tricks in the book for encrypting, but we eventually have to live in a real world with upsides and downsides to every strategy that we choose. And it's really important that you consider all the upsides and downsides so that you have a strategy that's right for you. It meets your needs against your threat within the resources that you have available to you. Um, so what we're gonna cover tonight, this talk is uh, hopefully part one of uh, further parts, and I'm gonna be focused on conveying some basic concepts. Uh, if you've been hacking Linux for a long time, uh, this may be a lot of review, and I know that there's some very experienced people in this room tonight, and I just wanna say I appreciate everybody for coming out, um, whether you're new at this or um, uh, an expert. Um, so uh, if you don't use Linux, that's okay too, because a lot of the basic concepts are universal and you can use them on Windows and Mac laptops with tools that are designed for those systems too, to basically to achieve the same thing. And I've tried to point out in uh, many places where those alternate tools uh, are for Mac and Windows. Um, we'll start with some simple stuff about encrypting and decrypting a single file, because if you can understand that, then basically everything else that you do on your hard drive is just that scaled up to your file system and automated behind the scenes so that you don't have to think about it. Uh, and the next thing we'll want to talk about is why would you even want to do this? The question is actually a little bit deceptive. It's not as simple as just, well, protect my data, duh. Um, and there are a lot of different strategies you can use. So as I mentioned, it's important to pick the right one for your needs. Um, you know, if you make it too cumbersome, you'll never use it, and so you've defeated yourself. Or even worse, you might think you're secure when you're actually not, and then you have a false sense of security. Um, from that, we'll talk into what, how you actually implement some of these strategies, and then we'll, I'll introduce you to some of the beginning steps for how you might go home tonight and put a, an encrypted partition or encrypt your whole Linux system or even your, um, your other operating system. Um, so let's see. Um, and also, we've got some laptops courtesy of the hackerspace that people can practice on tonight if they want. I've got some thumb drives with some installation ISOs, and we can go through it. And there's also a couple laptops that are set up for a capture the flag if you want to try your hand against uh, some encryption strategies. All right. So um, as I said, I recognize we have a, a diversity of experience in the crowd here. Uh, raise your hand if you consider yourself relatively new or a novice Linux user. OK, great. We've got. Um, some folks who are new to it. What if you're a longtime Linux user? Okay. Um, who's tried cracking passwords? All right. Were you successful? <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Uh, and uh, any IT security professionals in here? And uh, has anyone done forensic data recovery? All right. Feel free to chime in, please. If you see me saying something dumb or you think there's a better way to say it, um, 
don't be shy. And that goes for the same if you have questions too. Just holler them out by all means, okay? Um, so if anybody brought a laptop tonight and wants to play along, it only looks like I only see one or two laptops out there. Um, I want to give you a chance to install some useful tools that you might use to, as we go along with this. Um, GPG and PGP dump are two very basic command line tools that we'll show some examples of. And um, if you're on Windows and want to use similar tools, you can go to this website and, and download them. Uh, does anybody need this screen or can I move on? Uh, sure. All right. So um, this is just uh, an example. Um, is anybody not ever encrypted a file just for funsies on there? Have you guys encrypted stuff? <coughs> OK. So this is probably all a little bit more basic review, but just for the benefit of people who might be watching this video uh, later and um, aren't at the experience level that we have in this room, I'm just going to kind of cover some of these things here. Um, the first command, just echoing hello world to create a very simple text file. And then the second command using the GPG uh, tool on the command line to use a symmetric encryption algorithm. And uh, you're going to output it into a file called one.bin. And then you're going to display that to the screen. And as you can see, it looks like a bunch of garbage. You know, it doesn't look anything like the text string that you typed in. Um, for those folks who've never uh, worked with a hex editor before, this is what that data looks like in, in byte format. And uh, we'll come back to this. We'll see this screen again. And uh, as you can see, if you wanted to email an encrypted message to someone over email or some other text mode of communication, this is not very helpful. So GPG offers a really handy way of uh, improving on that. You can use the armor flag to ASCII armor this, and it's going to output it in some nice text that works really well cutting and pasting into uh, you know, some of our more common means of communication. It's basically the same data, just stored in a way that's more user-friendly for a lot of our popular communications modes online. <coughs> so we've got this file. Now let's prove that we can actually decrypt it. Anytime you encrypt a file, it might be a good idea or a good practice to generally check once in a while that you can actually access that data. So uh, you enter this command. You type in gpg uh, decrypt and then your file name, and then it spits it out. That's great, right? You didn't even have to type in a password if you've been following along on your laptop. And so you might say, wait a minute, don't I need a password to decrypt this? Does anybody know what's going on? Why didn't you have to enter a password here? Because well, you're encrypting and decrypting with no keys. Yeah, and so GPG does this really convenient thing for you. It remembers your passwords for about 10 or 15 minutes, depending on your configuration settings. Um, so if you rebooted your computer and ran this command again, it would prompt you for the password. Now. That's great, um, but we all know that with uh, a lot of convenience comes a lot of vulnerability too. And you might not want your computer to remember this password. So um, here's what you can do to make it forget. Uh, the GPG conf tool uh, can be used to kill the, uh, the daemon in memory. And then now if you go to decrypt that file again, it's going to prompt you for the password. Uh, so GPG uh, and has, a, has a lot of options. It's a very, very large Swiss Army knife. Um, there's various front ends out there, and it's a great tool. So what I would recommend is if you uh, are bored some afternoon, some evening, mess around with it, just tinker and see what you can do, um, and try not to lose, try not to brick any of your data. Um, but uh, that's uh, just kind of an introduction to some of its uh, capabilities. All right. Let's go a little bit further down the rabbit hole. Let's say you have an encrypted file and you want to know a uh, little bit more about it. Maybe you're like, gosh, this just looks like a random stream of bits. Maybe there's uh, some metadata that I can glean without knowing the password. So there's uh, another tool called PGP dump. Um, and this will, uh, will look at the header, and it can tell you a little bit of information about it. So here you can see uh, random.dat. Um, it's 256 bit uh, AES encryption, and it's got a salt. And, um, you know, it'll recognize um, a, a broad catalog of, uh, you know, standard encryption modes out there. Um, so, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. Just because you encrypt your file and you store it somewhere doesn't mean that someone who is a, maybe a motivated attacker can't find that file and glean some information off it. You know, metadata, uh, we've all heard stories, I'm sure, about people and institutions that have been burned because they left their GPS coordinates in a picture, 
or some a password was stored in the plain text somewhere and they weren't uh, aware of it. So, yes. Really quick, um, this PGP dump is it only for um, symmetric keys, or is this also like is it only used for PGP and UDPG type symmetric keys, or can it be used for other kinds of uh, headers as well? It should recognize uh, basically standard headers. There's a, an I think an, an ISO standard that it's um, that it's built to, and I'm not really familiar with that standard or how broad it is, but you can use this, and if it's encrypted with, uh, with public keys, um, it's, um, it w should be able to identify that too. It's not just for uh, symmetric. All right. Did it, that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, and for the microphone and the recording, if anyone um, didn't hear, the question was, uh, is uh, this tool, PGP dump, does it only work on uh, symmetric keys or does it work on other um, encryption uh, strategies as well? All right, so now let's say you're like, well, I've got this file and I want to obfuscate it a little bit more. I don't want this metadata just dangling out there in, in obvious land for everybody. So let's go back to our hex editor. And if you look at the first six bytes, um, this is where uh, uh, PGP dump is getting some of the, the first information. So one thing you might want to do is just go into your favorite hex editor and strip out the header. And then when you try to do a PGP dump, it's going to be um, confused, but now the problem is you have to remember what that header was if you want to use this your normal tool to go back and decrypt it. Uh, maybe you'll store that separately, maybe you'll encrypt that somewhere else, maybe you'll upload it from the cloud and wipe it from your computer. There's a lot of different things you can do. Um, so you're not really adding security necessarily, you're just adding obfuscation, obscurity. Uh, so Windows or Mac folks, no problem. As we said on the previous slide, uh, GPG for Win is a great tool. Um, and you can also go to gpgtools.org to get a, a lot more um, information and uh, uh, the manual and uh, even source code perhaps. So, uh, so congratulations. Um, anyone who's following along has just encrypted your first file perhaps. And um, before we scale this up to an entire hard drive and invest a lot of time and energy in doing that, I recommend thinking about three main questions which I've already mentioned. What are your needs, what are your threats, and what resources do you have available to you? And we'll kind of delve into this a little bit more. Um, so, you know, maybe you're a journalist in a country that doesn't really respect um, freedom of the press or human rights, and you have information that might lead you to being jailed or tortured, or might lead to some of your sources being jailed or tortured. Probably no one here is a dissident journalist, I'm guessing. Um, but that doesn't mean that you don't have information that you want to protect from the authorities for some legal or illegal reason. I'm not going to delve into that. Um, other types of needs out there might be um, maybe you're Meg Whitman and you're the CEO of a major corporation and you need to travel with a lot of corporate uh, data that's sensitive. And you know that there are, you know, we live in a world where there's such thing as corporate espionage and people like her uh, really need to have their their SHIT locked down. Uh, or maybe you're just a tourist looking like a soft target overseas, you know, walking around with your laptop half hanging out of your bag and any opportunistic street thief is just going to say, hey, maybe I can, uh, you know, make a quick buck uh, fencing their equipment or maybe I can log in and find out what I can about their identity and then steal their identity and sell their credit card numbers or, or spend them or something like that. So all these people are going to have different needs and they're going to have different, probably different access to resources and that's gonna change what kind of strategy they use for protecting their hard drive. Um, laptops being stolen was a big thing. That was probably my biggest concern when I decided one day that I wanted to encrypt my laptop. Um, and not because I work for the Secret Service or NASA or anybody important, but I have you know tax returns and other things on my hard drive that um, that I don't want out there. But this stuff makes the news, and thanks to these headlines, everyone in this room can be more aware that it's a real problem. Um, so there's other people um, out there who are not government employees necessarily, or have um, you know such. Um, significant professional interests that are impacted, but I want to tell a couple stories. Um, what do base jumpers, Air Force intelligence officers, and uh, Mozilla developers have in common with each other? 
Well, they've all had run-ins with authorities where um, they've had either their data seized or attempted to be seized for whatever reason. Um, these three gentlemen in the upper left were some base jumpers in New York City that when the Freedom Tower was being jumped, um, one of them was uh, an iron worker there and he got them onto the roof and they parachuted off and they almost got away with it. But someone um, getting a cup of coffee uh, at a quickie mart saw one of them land, called the cops. The cops looked at security cameras, traced this long chain of evidence and eventually narrowed it down to an address. And they raided it uh, with a SWAT team. They confiscated uh, some laptops and GoPros and they got videographic evidence that was used in court against these folks. Um, the city of New York actually spent about $500,000 pursuing them for the grand result of uh, getting conviction on a, a couple misdemeanors and acquittal on all the felony charges. Uh, <laughs> so we can talk about uh, effective use of uh, government resources another time, but if they had encrypted their data, um, the cases probably would have been thrown out against all of them. So um, here's a, perhaps a little less scandalous uh, situation. Uh, this woman is Diane May. She's a, um, a former Air Force intelligence officer and Iraqi cultural specialist as well. So you can imagine someone who's been deployed to the Middle East a lot, has access to top secret information and contacts and resources and a wealth of knowledge. She's probably got some very, very sensitive stuff on her laptop. Uh, she uh, got out of the Air Force and worked as a consultant, and she was coming back from a conference in Norway, um, coming back into the country at Miami Airport, and she was flagged for additional screening, perhaps because of her background, or maybe it was because of somewhere her passport had been. Um, you know, your, your passport has a, a chip in it, and all the ports of entry that you cross through around the world, it's going to flag. And if you come back to the country and they say, oh, so uh, how was your trip overseas? What countries did you go to? And you forget to mention, you know, a place like Iraq or Jordan or Syria, um, they can scan your passport and they'll find that out and they'll question you about it. Anyway, she was um, asked to divulge her passwords and pins for her devices. Uh, she felt under pressure and she did. And then for about two hours, she's going through uh, an interrogation while the, um, the Border Patrol had uh, unfettered access to her information. Uh, and just because they're the government doesn't mean those people looking at it necessarily have uh, a security clearance to see some of the things that she might have had. Um, so uh, she felt very concerned about that afterwards when she reflected upon the event and she joined an ACL lawsuit. Uh, and then this gentleman also is a uh, naturalized citizen and uh, a Mozilla developer who was uh, flagged for extra screening coming back through San Francisco after arriving from Europe. And um, he was put in a similar situation. They asked him for his passwords and he refused. You know, this guy is really well spun up on privacy issues and computer security. He'd probably have a very, very hard laptop to, uh, to exploit. Um, and so ultimately, after a couple hours of uh, being, um, you know, threatened with all sorts of things, um, Border Patrol basically gave up and they didn't confiscate his devices, but they did revoke his uh, global entry uh, clearance. So that's something that he paid money to get and had to go sit through an interview. So he suffered retaliation. And maybe one of your needs isn't just to protect your data. Maybe one of your needs isn't just um, you know, to keep your information secure. Maybe your need is also to protect yourself against retaliation from people who are pissed off at you that you didn't give them what they wanted. And he's also part of this lawsuit. Marv, yes? One note is that within 100 miles of any U.S. border, the Border Patrol has the authority, I won't say right, because I disagree that they have that right, but mm -hmm. they have the authority to um, do or to ask for your uh, pins and things like that. That 100 miles of the border of the country encapsulates like 80 to 90 percent of the population of the country because they live on the seacoast. Yeah. And so just something to think about when you're in California or New York. Yeah, or 80 to 90 percent of the places you might go. Uh, Marv, thank you. That's an excellent point, and that's actually a, a great uh, a great segue. Um, <laughs> uh, do uh, some updates on this. So the the lawsuit has been working its way through the courts, and that um, exception you talked about the um, the border exemption. 
for the uh, search and seizure rules um, may be put to uh, an end for some devices. There's a bipartisan bill that's been introduced in the Senate at least, uh, which would put an end to that kind of search at least on electronic devices at the border. It actually doesn't really get into the 100 mile thing. That's a whole nother separate problem, I think, from a, from a, a libertarian point of view. Um, but uh, if 80 to 90 percent of the population or whatever the number is, is affected by this exception, at what point is the exception now the norm? You know, something to think about. Uh, searches are on the rise also. Um, this is a little bit old data at this point. It's hard to get new data, but basically this is showing over the years how the uh, trajectory of the number of devices searched is pretty much on an exponential uh, path right now. And it's probably up to, four, I've heard it's in like 45 to 50,000 uh, from some more recent data. Um, so the chance of you getting flagged is still really, really small. It's 0.005%. But there might be certain things about your background. You know, maybe you have a blog with some political opinions on it, or maybe you've traveled to certain countries. That can jack your risk of getting flagged for extra security uh, very high. And it would be nice to have a strategy on your computer where you can protect your data and also not make it obvious that there's anything there so they don't even waste their time searching yet you have something hidden. Um, other things that have gone, there's, there's actually multiple lawsuits out there. Um, there have been non-border raids, including on journalists. So this is a problem that's everywhere. Um, so let's change gears a little bit. I think I've made my point that, and you're all here, so you understand that this is a major issue. Now that we are past that, what do we want to get out of disk encryption? I just want to kind of pull the audience here, just holler out, what are some things that you're interested in, in achieving? Regulatory compliance. Regulatory compliance. That's a really good one. If you work is, with anything that's uh, PCI, PHI, PII, uh, you're under both uh, contractual and legal obligations, if not moral obligations, mm -hmm. to protect that. And that's encryption and data flight, encryption and data address. So if you work in healthcare, for example, that definitely applies to you, right? If you don't work in healthcare, but you're working in HR and you have to file people's FMLA regulation or yeah. uh, stuff, you have PHI that is under HIPAA. Yeah. That's an excellent point. And that's something that we would all want to make sure is part of our encryption if we are under some sort of uh, regulatory burden. Um, who else? What, what else would uh, people want to get out of this? Bueller. Lengthen the time for people to attack. <laughs> so making yourself a, a harder target? or yeah. Okay. Just, it, there can be easier enough to track them. You have to be a harder target than people around you. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to be the fastest runner. You just have to be faster than the second slowest runner that the bear is chasing, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else? Any other things we might want to get? We already mentioned a couple of them. We want to keep our data safe. We want to not suffer retribution if we fail to comply. Um, I came up with kind of a list here. We want the data to be available to us. If we encrypt it so hard that we can't get it, or the encryption is so cumbersome that we, it just takes forever, it's not really useful, is it? We want it to be available to others that uh, we want to share the data with legitimately. Um, apps like uh, Signal um, are probably a common way that people use that and don't even think about it. Um, Secure Hypertext Pro HTTPS. Um, we use that all the time and we don't even think about it on most of the websites we go to nowadays. Uh, we want it to be private so people who can't, who shouldn't have access to it, can't access it. We want it maybe to have deniability. That's something where if someone says, I think you have data here, you can say prove it. And they can't prove it because they can look through your hard drive and you've gone through and you've scrubbed out um, all of the suggestive or incriminating metadata or other little tidbits that they might latch on to to prove that you're trying to hide something. Um, we might want it to be destroyable. Let's say that you're put in a situation where someone has a $5 wrench and they're going to beat you until you get this data. Most of us probably don't have 
the burden of carrying information that we're willing to sacrifice our health and well-being to protect. <laughs> Hopefully not anyway, but there are people out there who, who do and they want their data to be destroyable under uh, certain circumstances. Um, we want it to be easy to use, we want it to be portable, maybe even cross-platform. We want it to be reliable and resilient so that if um, you need it, you 100% can count on it being there when you need it. Um, and we also maybe want it to be a, a fault tolerant or mistake tolerant. Like if we screw up one little thing, we don't want to brick our hard drive and lose our data and accidentally destroy it too. Um, we also maybe want to have a system where um, or maybe our operating system is paranoid and maybe it re-authenticates us at certain intervals so that if you are working at your laptop in a public space, you turn your back for two seconds and someone steals your laptop, you know, if they close the lid and open it up and you have a screensaver password, that's a great example that you wouldn't even think about where you have to re-authenticate. Or maybe you have something that every certain period of time, so that if your laptop is confiscated and, you know, someone is in there and typing away, exploiting it, all of a sudden a, a window pops up and they can't proceed until they get a password. So these are all just concepts to think about, and you can go way down the rabbit hole, but I'm making the point that hard drive encryption is not just as simple as clicking the box encrypt my home folder when you start a new Linux installation, for example. Um, so what are some big picture strategies we can do to do this? So uh, we already walked through earlier in the evening an example of encrypting a single file. And for some people, maybe that's all you need. Maybe you can just put them into a folder, zip it up into an archive, and now you can just encrypt that folder. Um, these are simple things. You don't need to make major changes to your file system or your online or your, or your electronic lifestyle to implement. Um, getting a little more complicated, maybe you want to encrypt uh, an entire partition or even your entire hard drive, which is probably why a lot of us are here tonight. And then you can also encrypt things on the cloud, which is a whole other realm, which is kind of beyond the scope of tonight, but something that could be a useful adjunct to some of our strategies if we want to cross a border, for instance. Um, now, as far as actually doing this, there's uh, two basic strategies that I'll introduce here tonight. And this is just a brief introduction because so we're not going to get too technical. But it's important to know when you're picking a hard drive encryption strategy that you know that there's blocked devices and there's stacked file system devices. And these are examples of two of the common systems, uh, common options available for Linux. And, and VeraCrypt is another one uh, which we'll talk a little bit about too. And so what's the difference? What, what is a blocked system and what is a stacked system? So a blocked device basically takes your storage media, treats it as one block and encrypts everything and the file structure, the file system structure and all the, the overhead used to kind of maintain the system is encrypted with it. That's uh, complementary to a stacked system where um, in some cases the structure of your file system is available in plain, uh, in plain data, um, but what they've done is you have it set up so you're encrypting small nuggets, whether they're files or sectors or other little parts of your file system. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each one. A block device, to me, my impression is it's a more robust solution, but it might be slower because now you've got a lot of data that you have to encrypt and decrypt all the time. A stacked system might have the advantage of being more granular. You can have more individual control over the files. It can be easier to implement uh, post-installation if you're working on a hard drive that already has a lot of data and you don't want to take everything off and then put it back on. You just want to encrypt it in place. Um, and uh, NTFS is uh, you know, something that's also uh, built into, let's see, let me rephrase that. So, um, the stack systems, my impression, someone correct me if this is wrong, is that that's generally what Windows and BitLocker tends to use. Um, and the block system is what I found delving into Linux options to be the most available, but it's also easiest to do if you're doing from a fresh installation. Okay, so I want to kind of back up a little bit. Let's say we have um, a file system that lets us encrypt um, you know, files here and there, and we want to make sure that the original data isn't still lingering somewhere on our hard drive, just not visible to us. Um, you know, 
perhaps everybody knows that when you just delete a file off your hard drive, it doesn't actually disappear. It's just taken out of the table of contents. So the information is still exists. And you encrypt a file, you go archive it somewhere, you forget about it, and then you delete the original. You want to make sure it's really deleted. And so the shred command is a command in Linux that if you haven't heard of, um, it's a good thing to practice with. So basically, you execute a command similar to this, and they have various options that you can use depending on your need. It basically gives you the option of overwriting your file with random gibberish or zeros or whatever you want, and then renaming it, and then deleting it so that someone going in with forensic tools probably is not going to be able to um, recover this data if you do it right. Um, Marv, you've done some forensic data uh, recovery. Um, what's your? Can I ask what your take is on the effectiveness of tools like this? It, they can be quite effective, but you also have to consider things like the going back. This isn't traditional metadata, but there's the history command. Mm -hmm. If you shred a bunch of a bunch of file names with incriminating information and create the larger history. That's going to show up, and so it's. I haven't gotten to the level of like trying to recover big or, or, or no one's used shred, and I've tried to recover that. People have deleted things and you know, tried to obfuscate it, and I've had to recover things like that for investigations for work. I'm no pro at it. I wouldn't call myself a forensics analyst or find the scratch, but mm -hmm. uh, it, you said if you are going to rely on it, you have to make sure that you're doing it smart and you're not leaving other traces that you've done things that can then become evidence against you. Uh, once e-discovery happens, uh, you're already having a bad day, but it, it could be a lot worse if, if uh, shred, here's my confession, dot, dot. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Something else to look for is maybe you're working on a journaling file, a journaling uh, file system, where it's going to keep records, snapshots, and time. Is that what you're talking about with history? Like, or did you mean more no, like browser? Bra What's that? The Linux history. Oh, the Linux history. Yeah. Yep. History shows you yeah. all the commands that you've run. Yeah. Um, so maybe they can say, "Oh, he ran the shred command. Now we're using a journaling file system. Let's go back and." Take, find a snapshot of that information you deleted, and now they could, hopefully you're not trying to obstruct justice or you're not doing anything illegal, but it doesn't help your case or make you look any better. Um, but if you really want to make sure that your tax returns and your password files uh, are safe from um, you know, common threats, this command might help you. Um, just to, you know, you can use the look at the man page for the commands, but the, basically in this example, um, the U option truncates and removes the file um, after overriding the V verbose just to show what's going on, and the Z after uh, it uh, overwrites it with uh, four, three passes of random uh, data, it overwrites it with zeros. Is that helpful? I don't know. Um, I think you were mentioning earlier that uh, the DOD standard in some cases is to overwrite three times. Um, and I've heard that either, even overriding once or twice makes it extremely hard for someone who's doing a forensic analysis, but I'm not a forensic investigator, so it's all just kind of rumor. Um, if you're on Windows, uh, Cypher EXE is a similar tool. It's, um, I'm not as well versed in it, so what I would say is this is a lead that uh, feel free to explore more information on this on your own if you have a need in Windows to, um, what it does is it doesn't overwrite a specific, it doesn't shred a certain file. What it does is it just takes all the unused um, space on a hard drive and overwrites it with, with garbage. Um, OK. Cover a little bit here about Windows and Mac OS real quick. Um, if you are one of those users, um, BitLocker, if you have Windows 10 Pro Edition, if you're like most people who just bought your laptop at a store and it comes with Windows 10 Home Edition, you're out of luck for BitLocker. You're going to have to upgrade and not spend $99 if you only use BitLocker. But fortunately, there's Veracrypt, which you can download. It's um, open source. Um, it has basically the same suite of um, 
features that uh, BitLocker does. It has you can do pre-boot authentication. It can hide volumes for plausible de deniability. It has uh, pipelining and parallelization, which are basically like it reads files ahead and it decrypts them on the fly in anticipation of you needing them, just like a you know um, you know a cache, so that it speeds things up. You're not sitting there watching the clock tick as uh, it decrypts the data that you need to use. Um, and then uh, Mac OS, uh, File Vault 2. I'm not a Mac guy. Is anybody a Mac person in here? Use one. Yeah, anybody? Not, not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> any anybody uh, use File Vault 2? Have any experience with it? Yeah. Any impressions of it? I mean, it works. It works. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of seems to be my impression of a lot of things Mac. Like, it's there, it works, and then you don't until really it doesn't, yeah, until it doesn't. Mad. Yeah, and then you can't really do anything to fix it when it doesn't work because it's Mac. Works great until it doesn't anymore. Um, so let's see. Um, decision time. So we're getting closer now. You want to encrypt your hard drive. Um, some decisions to make. Do I want to do this on a new install or do I want to try and encrypt data in place? Uh, Veracrypt, uh, BitLocker, and I believe FileVault uh, no, 2 make it easy for you to encrypt data that's already on your hard drive without having to start over from scratch. Um, uh, Lux, which is the Linux unified key system, if I didn't say it earlier. Um, again, in my experience, it seems to be easiest to do if you do it from a fresh install. Um, so you have to kind of sit down and you know, plan ahead. If you just go back up your data and uh, start downloading stuff and trying to install file systems like I did, you're going to probably not be using your time very efficiently. <laughs> um, so just try to plan ahead. Um, so uh, something that uh, I hoping that we we can I'll go home and do tonight. If uh, if you haven't done it before, is feel comfortable at least giving this a shot. So. Um, first step, back up your data. Back it up, back it up, back it up. Um, and then if you have never used um, Linux before and you want to try, you know, take the plunge, I think this is a great opportunity to start out with an encrypted partition or encrypt your whole uh, hard drive, including your boot sector too, if you want. Um, and then um, if uh, people do this, and want to come back for the next talk and talk about, share their experience and reflections on it, I think that would be really awesome. Um, so I use Linux Mint for the uh, demo laptops that uh, we have here. And um, this is the home pages where you can download it. And if anyone wants, I've got some thumb drives if you trust strange thumb drives, which you probably never should. But you can try them on the laptops and then uh, you know, not uh, um, you know, d sully your own devices with them. Um, you can try that tonight. Uh, so you can download it there. Um, if you're on Windows, uh, if you're a Windows user, first thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to put this ISO file onto some bootable media, like uh, a thumb drive that you purchased from a safe source. So how do you do that in Windows? Anybody, uh, any Windows people who are primarily or only Windows users here? Rufus is awesome. Okay. Rufus yeah. Is yeah. Win32 disk image. Yeah, there's a lot of options. There's I also boot ISO. What's that? Boot yeah, boot ISO. I think a Windows Media Creator can also do it too. Um, there's a lot of options. The point of this wasn't to go through and list the catalog of you know umpty umpty gazillion uh, <coughs> tools out there that can do this, but Rufus seems to be very well regarded, um, proved by Marv as well. <laughs> so uh, you can use this once you download that ISO throw your USB um, in a drive and uh, then run this program. And now you've got a bootable, uh, a bootable media that you can um, load up for uh, Linux here. And this is a, basically a live session off the USB. And you click on the Install Linux Mint icon. And up comes you know, your, uh, your installer. This, uh, in this case, Linux Mint uses Ubiquity. Uh, and early on, you'll be pressed with the question, do I want to erase the whole disk and install Linux Mint? If you don't want to dual boot or have other partitions on there you want to um, protect or reserve space for, you know, check the first box. And then encrypt the new uh, Linux Mint installation for security. Um, that's option A. And it works. It's just simple. Out of the box, it just really works. Um, it's hard to screw it up. Um, I'm, I probably have screwed it up, but it's hard to screw up. Uh, if you want to choose something else, 
it will bring you to a view where you can look at um, the partitions. If you're into manually editing your partitions, you can do that here. And this option is important if you want to dual boot or if you want to uh, encrypt your, uh, your boot partition as well. And there's a great tutorial out there in the Linux Mint community which steps you through. Um, and uh, it's a long tutorial. I'm not going to just go through that because that's something we can all kind of do on our own. Um, but uh, just to let you know it's possible and it's not that hard. What I really want to do tonight is not necessarily just give lots of factual information or details, but also give a lot of encouragement and tell you that if I can do it, I'm not an IT professional by any stretch of the imagination, then you can too. Um, so that's um, kind of the beginner's roadmap to how you start doing this. How do you get your foot in the door? Um, we covered a lot of information over the last 40 minutes. Does anybody have questions or concerns or anything I said not add, add up? I have another question. Yeah. Um, BitLocker works best if you have, uh, it's really designed for laptops, that's your, your primary use for it. Uh, if your laptop has a QT module, which is a trusted something Just module. Trusted platform? Yeah, a trusted platform, platform module. Yeah. Um, the, that is a hardened enclave that lives on the uh, main board that your keys are stored in. Mm -hmm. That it does make BitLocker easier. Uh, there are downsides to that too. Mm -hmm. um, usually it needs to be like a domain connected machine to really get the full use out of it. This guy could probably talk better about it than I can. Mm -hmm. uh, or you could use like a, a USB drive as your recovery key if you ever do need to recover your BitLocker key. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it does a really good job at hiding that stuff from you and keeping you from fucking it up. So. <laughs> Yeah, BitLocker to go as well as um, if you don't have a TPM chip, then also um, on the motherboard, then an HSM also can do a pretty good job. Okay. But that can cost as much as your laptop. <laughs> yeah. And for everyone's benefit here, can you tell what an HSM is? Um, Hardware security module. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's just instead of being on your board directly and having to be built onto the board, it's something that you can just plug in on the side as more of a modular. Yeah, the USB ones, yeah. It's like a TPM built into a thumb drive. Yeah. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a hardware authentication tool that's portable. It's yes. Not like one of those two F eight like thumb drives you can plug. They're in. kind of similar, but no. Similar, just that it encrypts your stuff with it. So instead of the UV key giving you like prompting, hey, put in your key and then you you open it up, instead it helps encrypt your entire system. Yeah. But use a UV key anywhere that you. I like them. I'm just afraid of losing. <laughs> Good and tight. Yeah. At the rate I lose things, I'm a little scared to uh, take the plunge. Yeah. That's why I have lots of Any other questions? Concerns, clarifications, corrections? Still a little mad at you about the sticker. That's the only concern I have. That, 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 might, that might be a clue for the capture of the flag, actually. Just saying. <laughs> Um, so uh, what I'd like to talk about next time, um, if people uh, like this talk and want to hear more, there's, we're just like peering over the edge of the rabbit hole. You can go so far down this thing, and I've got some more great material, um, but I wanted to keep this as beginner friendly as possible tonight. Not really sure like what kind of uh, uh, people might be interested in coming. Um, I mentioned that I've got some capture the flag. If you want to try your hand at some of these uh, challenges, come find me. If you want to do a, a, a dress rehearsal of installing this kind of system on a laptop, come find me also and we can do that on these laptops too. Uh, other things, if you uh, want do this at home and want to come back for the next talk and kind of share your reflections, I'd really encourage you to do that and just kind of please take some notes if you think that would be uh, of uh, value or interest to you as you go through your own journey. Um, other things you want to do, if you, if anyone wants some extra credit and wants to figure out how do I, how do I back up and encrypt the contents of my Android phone, for instance? I'm not sure if you can do it on a, on an iPhone, but um, you can definitely take everything off your Android phone, put it into a container, encrypt that, wipe your phone off, and then when you're next time you're going through uh, customs and they ask to uh, inspect your devices, you can, having already done this and wiped your phone, just give them an empty phone with a 
It's basically in a factory reset condition. And as soon as you're on the other side, download your image. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they love that. <laughs> um, download your image, decrypt it, and reinstall it onto your Android phone. And now you've successfully traversed the border without risking any of your data. Because the interesting thing that that um, that border search exemption and the extra leeway that um, uh, federal officers have does not apply to material on the cloud, according to the courts. And another little tidbit I didn't mention on the courts, the federal circuit courts uh, are actually now split on what rights uh, you have or don't have at the border. So you can probably expect this to go uh, to the Supreme Court in the next couple of years or sooner. So yeah. All right. Well, that, uh, that concludes my talk. Thanks for coming out tonight.